Praise God. God is truly awesome. I want to get to the question box. And Sister Michelle is bringing the question box here. Thank you very much. And Sister Michelle, if you want to tarry a little bit, I know you really don't like the camera. You're always working behind the scene. So um, how is the prayer ministry going in your end? I know you're talking about a prayer and fasting, that you were praying and the Lord was saying that we should fast more. Do you have something coming up? Yes, you know what? I was impressed today by the Lord to actually um, today mention to everybody that to call a fast, to call a fast for this Sabbath, and we're going to be meeting at the head office at 2720 Rena Road, and to just have an experience in prayer. There's so many of us that have needs. There's so many of us that are going through something. So I want us, whoever is interested, however the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart, to invite you out to come to 2720 Rena Road, Mississauga. And if you need the more details, you can go to the website of the address. And to just come and experience a day of prayer and worship because we just need the power of God to come down, Brother Patrick. Amen. And it's just going to be a spirit-filled day. We're going to be praying. Bring your scriptures. Whatever your issue is, whatever you're going through, search the scriptures. Bring it. We are going to claim it in the name of Jesus. And so what time this is that going to be? What time? So we're going to meet around 10 a.m. Sabbath morning. This Sabbath. If somebody can give me the actual date. Um, 24th, March 24th, 10 a.m. at the Button to Christ head office at 2720 Rena Road, prayer and fasting, brethren. So there's an urgency to pray then because yes. Christ is coming and he's bidding us to come into more fervent prayer. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Well, Praise you God. heard that from Sister Michelle. Thank you very much. Amen. So you know you're welcome. You know, I'm going to go straight to the, the prayer box the question box and see what we have here. Remember you can submit your question if there's something you wanna know. Wow, this is a long question. <laughs> this is a long question. And the question says, on the prior line you mentioned that in regards to the suicide, the enemy has to go through God first and that we all have a guardian angel. If this is the case, how comes some suicides are successful and some are not, if we all have a guardian angel? Ah, oh, interested. So, the question is saying then, um, if we do have a guardian angel that follows us and everything have to pass through God first, how come some suicide are successful? Well, you see, the guardian angels are there. First, you gotta know why they're there. Some people have their guardian angels and they don't call for help. You know, if you don't pray and ask God, and you know you can commission and ask God for more help, to send more angels. But if an angel is assigned to us to follow us, they will influence us or they will impress us through the Holy Spirit and say, don't go into that place, it's not good. But some of us, I, I know Brother Andrew always says, you know, some people, their guardian angels work harder. <laughs> <laughs> because they have to impress them. Don't do that. Don't do that. And they won't force you. I'm getting a feedback still. I'm still getting a feedback. It's, it's off. It's off. I'm still getting a feedback. So what I'm saying though, the guardian angel will not force you. God doesn't force people against their will. He will feed you enough information for you to make the decision. That's how it works. So if you are in a situation where you are suicidal, first of all, you have open doors. It's either you've been raped or you've been through, through traumas in your life and you're hearing thought 
and voices saying to you, you are not good enough, you should end your life. At the same time, the Spirit of God will come and impress you and say, don't do that. I love you. Why would you do that? I have a place secure for you. But that person, if that person is in deep depression and they are feeding that depression, then they are hearing the voice louder. You should do it. Nobody cares about you. That person have to make that decision. The garden angel not going to force you. God will go probably to somebody else and say, pray for this person now or call them. And sometimes they may just receive a call when they were on the edge or on the brink. We heard um, Sister Felicia, when I interviewed her here, she said she was in a state of depression and she was suicidal. And she was at a place alone. Nobody's supposed to be around that area the where she was. And somebody showed up and speak encouragement to her. And right away she saw hope. That was an angel the Lord sent in the physical to help you. So you could have 10 guardian angels. If you are not right and listening to the Spirit of God, he's not going to force you. If that was the case, God will have angels appearing before people and say, you better serve me or not. I'm going to take you out now. You better serve me. You better become a Seventh-day Adventist now. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but God doesn't work like that. He impresses the heart. He shows you. Remember in the prayer line this morning, I did Psalms what? what? 116. That was powerful. I was just there and the Lord showed me that Psalms. That's a love Psalms. That the Psalms showing gratitude of how much we appreciate God. And that's what God wants. He wants us to show appreciation. And God will help us. As we feed the spiritual man, God will speak to us. And if we are really a true Christian who is feeding the spiritual man, right away when that thought comes for suicide, you're going to just say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And that devil is gone. Amen. You know, so we don't have to say the guardian angel because they have their purpose. Because the devil wants us dead. If it wasn't for the guardian angels, we would have been dead. I remember, uh, I remember a case with a Seventh-day Adventist pastor in the U.S. where he went to visit a young lady and she was possessed. And when he was speaking to her, the demon spoke through her and says, we try to push her over the balcony and it will go down as suicide, but her guardian angel wouldn't let us. Mercy. So it was going against her will there and the Lord stepped in and provide security. And that's who we serve, a God who provides security mercy. I remember another case where a young lady overdosed on medication and it was revealed again. We gave her medication but her garden angel wouldn't allow it to come into effect. Mercy. That's how the judge of all overrule. That's the God we serve that can step in and save us and overrule the enemy. What a loving God we serve. What a mighty rock who cares about every one of us. He cares about us. I know tonight the word is going to be really deep. And I know last week, I'm going to touch on the word last week and what we did last week. Let us just pray right now and be in the mind of worship. You watching on the prayer line and the Facebook, be in the mode of worship. You're listening on the prayer line. You're calling in from different countries. We are connected via internet. God have your back. I'm telling you, this is powerful. And, you know, remember if you're watching or you're 
in the audience and you want to text somebody, let them know it's live. They can go to Facebook Live, Button to Christ, and they can watch it live because God is going to do a mighty work. We're going to pray right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, great God, we come to you, O God, under your anointing, under your power, under your glory. We invite your holy presence, O God, with power and with might, that as your people fellowship together, Holy Ghost power will reconsecrate this sanctuary and you will reconsecrate every minds and hearts, every visiting friends like Sister Melissa and all those who are here visiting for the first time and all of us as we link together, watching for the first time. Iron sharpeneth iron. Lord, may you fellowship with us because anywhere there's light, there cannot be any darkness. Amen. So, Lord, we appreciate you, and we come believing and trusting in you. This is my humble prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Praise God. Amen. God is awesome. Last Tuesday, the Lord allowed me to go into some scriptures that talks about the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And how this name is so powerful. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Remember, when you call on the name, you, have, you should add the name Nazareth. From the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Be Nazareth because that's what differentiates the true Jesus. You know that in Spanish, they say Jesus, and they, they say a lot of things, Jesus. Uh, people can call that name. But what differentiates is that name that is above all name. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the, the, the signature name because he was born there. No other person was born in a manger there. He's different. There's power in this name. Power. And I share a testimony before of a gentleman I used to work with in the aircraft industry, but I don't know him other than seeing him. I've never spoken to him. And one day I shared a testimony that I saw him talking to a group of people. And while they were talking to the group of people, he was speaking, he was telling them that his girlfriend believed in the dark side. And when she's going to come over to his house, he will make the Freemason sign, he will make the lodge sign, he will make, bring over the Ouija board, and she will be happy. But he said at times things become like crazy. He said things start to levitate, things start to move from walls. He was telling a group of people, I was just listening. And he said, when it get out of control, I call on the name of Jesus and everything stopped. Oh, yes. So I went up to him and I touched him and I said, do you know who Jesus really is? And he says, no, but it works. <laughs> this is a true story. It happened to me. So if this man don't know Jesus, but he call on the name. And the devil is afraid of the power of this name. God is saying, why don't we take that authority and start a call on the name and declare it and see the power of God work? I'm telling you, if we do that, God's people are going to see more breakthroughs. We're going to see more answers to prayer. Because we're calling on the name. So last week we spoke about the name. And then I touched a little bit on the blood of Jesus. And I went into scripture and I showed you about the blood way back in Egypt that was placed on the doorpost. That blood represents something. The blood was shed on the cross. 
Before Christ came, they used to offer a lamb. They will cut the lamb and the blood will be spilled, making atonement for their sins. There's something about the blood, not to mention the blood of Jesus Christ where there's power. You know, when we go on missions and we sing the song, there's power in the blood, the, angel, the, the devil tremble when we sing that song continuously. There's power in the blood. Lord of mercy. God is saying we're not claiming that authority. And the Lord showed us also about this blood. So here, if I was to title this sermon, Brother Shea, it, the title would be How to Apply God's Word. Because God is saying we know the word, but we don't know how to apply it. And that's why we're not getting answers to prior. We don't know how to apply the promises, the principles of God to see action. I always said that when I seen the pioneers, the powerful men of God pray, like, like um, Daniel and Abraham, when they prayed, they prayed and they used examples from the Bibles, like in Hebrews. They will say, Lord, you are my God. You know, you cannot lie. And they will use some promises that God cannot get out of it. God have to answer. I'm telling you, they're powerful, Sister Isabel. God is so powerful that if we were to write the promises and we start to pray with precision, with authority, to the name of Jesus Christ, and we call on that name, that authority, we're going to see God work. We're going to experience his power if we were to do that. But we don't have the time to do that. You know, I was speaking to somebody today, and I read a few scriptures, and I asked them to, to, to explain certain scriptures, and they couldn't. And I was saying to myself, a lot of us, read the scriptures daily and we're not able to break down the scriptures because we, we just go fast over it and we don't allow it to soak in and the Holy Ghost power to use us. We don't allow it. We just read over the scripture. We don't really take a while on verse 1 and think about it. What does it mean when you read about what goes on in heaven. And I gave a few examples. If I, I'll give an example here because this is teaching. I, I, I preach a sermon on Isaiah chapter 6. And I'll give you an example. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Come on. Imagine that. If, when I read this, I did a couple sermons on this on their online. When I read that, I start to ask God, explain to me, Holy Spirit, what you're talking about here. In the year King Uzziah died, so I go back to find out when did he die and who was King Uzziah. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Why did God insert that in that first verse? Because Isaiah was in mourning and he was looking towards that king. But God smite that king and that king was dead. And he was wrestling to say, God, if I'm a Christian, why you kill the king? You can go and research it. But he said, while he was wrestling, he said they saw, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. God showed him that you think that was a king? Take a look at the real king. Oh, and he, he start, so you, when you start to look at it and say, Lord. So it took me hours now to go and research that. 
to find out. Some people will just read over it. They will reach verse 10 already. I'm telling you. Because God is saying we're not soaking in the word. I read just one more verse. And it says, above it stood the seraphims. Do you know who the seraphims are? Mercy. Do you know the powerful seraphims? Hear what it says. It said, each one had six wings. Have you ever seen a being with six wings? With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. So six wings. He covered his face. He covered his feet. Humility. The brightness. He cannot take the brightness of the throne of God. And they go around in the next verse saying, holy, holy. They're looking at each other and saying, holy. God is so powerful. They cannot look on the throne. When you read the Bible like that and apply the word, you're going to experience the power. But if we just read the word and go over it, we ain't getting it. No wonder we're not experiencing the power of God because we don't understand the promises. We don't understand how to apply the words of God. Many of us know the words, but we don't know how to apply it. We study it, as I said, but we don't know how to apply it. We don't know how to pray with authority and claim the promises, which is the word. We don't know how to improve our prayer life using the word. If we want our prayer life to be improved, we have to apply the words, get the promises and fill in the blank space and apply it with precision and see the power of God work. Precision. Applying the word. The word is the key. We don't know how to allow the word, the words of God to be effective. We're calling and we're not seeing nothing happening. We don't understand. I shared a testimony a few years back. I was doing a session somewhere and a gentleman came there and said that his little granddaughter is constipated for weeks and they, they flush her, they did everything and she's still constipated. And he came into the, the, the congregation that I was doing and he was seated way back there. And when time come, I said, I'm going to pray and anybody wants a deliverance, step out in the hall. I'm claiming the promises and we're going to see the power of God work here tonight. And when I said that, I saw him stepped out with the granddaughter. I prayed a prayer to God, claiming the promises of God. And I can stand here and say, when that gentleman went home, he called me and said, everything came out. Everything came out. Everything was flushed from his granddaughter. That's the power of God. That's the promises. I remember one more as the Holy Spirit reminds me. I remember in Hamilton, a mother was pushing her child, her baby, in a, in a, in a, 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 a supermarket trolley. And we ought to know that. You never should put your child in a trolley when you go to the supermarket. If you're doing that, you better stop it. There are so many children died from that. Because when you go outside with the groceries, what you usually do is take the groceries out first and let the car turn over with the child. It happened all the time in America because we're not using the wisdom. So this mother went and the, and the, the car turned over and hit the child's head and she became become a, unconscious. So she was in the Hamilton Hospital, and while she was there, a couple of days after I got the call, she was like in a coma. And I was praying some deep prayer then, trust me. And I went to the basement, and I lay out my requests and the promises before God, and I start to pray for this child. I never met the child before. I never met the child. 
but somebody brought the prayer request. And when I laid it out, I started to pray with precision and might to our Savior, God Almighty. And while I was praying, I saw a child like just move her legs. The vision just came up to me. I saw a child move their legs. In about a few hours, I got a call that the child came out of the coma. So listen, I was doing a program in Hamilton East Church, and I did not know that they were going to come there. The dad and they came because they said the child not supposed to walk again. And the child walked in. All she had was a, a neck bra brace support. And she walked in with her dad. I did not know it was them. And I called them up to do an interview and learn that the dad was a medical doctor. I did not know. He said he read the report and the x-ray and everything. And the child not supposed to walk. That's why they came there to testify. Wow. They weren't even Adventists. The power of God, when we claim the promises and lock in in prayer, we're going to see God work. We're going to see the power of God, power being executed. We cannot see the power unless, unless we claim the promise. I want you to go with me back to Revelation 12. God summoned me and says, go back to Revelation 12. And I'm going to repeat what the Lord showed me because this is key to, for some of us. And we have to go to Revelation 12. And here I'm going to read from verse, I will read verse 7 then. The key verse is verse 11. But I want to go back to verse, yeah, so I'll go to verse 7. And hear what it says. And it says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angel fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And he says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before God, our God, day and night. So, it's concluded that there was war in heaven and Satan was cast out. I'm going to show you how God showed us to apply the blood. We're talking about applying the word of God to see results in prayer. Verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So remember, he came down with great wrath to fight against us, Christ's handmaid, us as fellow servants of God. He can't win the war in heaven, so he decided, I'm going to come down here and fight. I'm going to make, create chaos down here. So imagine then, and then hear what it says now. And it says, I'm reading it over again. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. What God showed us is that there is power. If you realize that revelation was given to John on the Isle of Patmos. He, he was given a glimpse of the end time event, of what going to happen. He was given a glimpse into prophecy of what going to happen. So here the Lord is saying, listen, 
if we want to see a powerful breakthrough, claim verse 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, the Lord showed us that in order to activate this power, we should ask God evil permission to apply his blood to the word. Because his blood becomes our defense. His blood now can seal us. And when there's a defense, it meant that, look, this way. The defense is here, the shield, which is the blood. And we are hiding behind. The devil cannot touch us. He can't pass the defense line. He said he overcame. He won the victory through the blood of Jesus. If we understand the, 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 the effect and the power of his blood and what it meant, what it represents, it's not only just the blood, it's Christ's blood, it's the atoning blood, sacrifices that he made for you and I. God is saying now, so for example, if you're going to pray for somebody, you can try it, it's faith. I'm praying and I've seen it work already. I'm praying for somebody and I said, Lord, I'm asking you permission to apply the blood. You can go back and say, I don't see that where you have to ask God permission. How hard it is to ask permission then? Is it wrong? <laughs> you know what I mean? You can ask God's permission, get his permission. So here it is now. You go to God and say, Lord, I'm asking you permission to use your blood as a defense. Just as it, like in Ephesians 6, where he said, put the armor on. I'm asking you permission. And because we are his child, he said there's nothing good that he would withhold from them that love the Lord. And when you claim that now and you go and you say, no, Lord, I'm asking you that your blood will seal me and stand and break all principalities and hide me, O oh God, under your shadow. Let your blood be my covering, my defense, and seal it. I know the devil cannot touch me because I'm, my defense is the blood of Jesus Christ. But you see, there's wisdom in the thinking of it. There's wisdom, brethren. I want you to go to one more scripture. I want you to go to Job. Job chapter 22. Go to Job chapter 22. God is, is giving us some serious thing here tonight. Job 22. So Job comes before the psalm. Job 22. You see, God is showing his people something here, how to exercise the power, how to see God work in the spiritual realm. You know what I mean? So Job 22, and I'm going to start at, okay, here it is. I want to read a little bit, okay. I want to go from verse 25. So Job 22, verse 25 says, Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense. When we put Jesus before us, nobody can break that barrier. That's why when we put the armor on, it is Christ Jesus. They use the Roman garment to describe how we should armor up because the Roman soldiers use the armor where they put the head, the, the, the shield, the breastplate. It's a Roman thing. But God is saying, I've given you the physical application, but it's actually Jesus you're putting on. When Jesus Christ, his robe and his blood covers you, no armor, no physical armor can pierce that. That's what God is saying. When you apply this blood, this armor of Christ, it's our defense. So therefore, it says in Job 22 from verse 25, Yea, the Almighty shall be 
thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. He's saying you should have growth, you should have blessings, you should have money, you can have anything when Christ is your defense. Because poverty can't touch you. Certain things cannot pierce you because you're covered. We have a defense. So why don't we use Christ then as our defense? Why do we try to fight the battle on our own? Be honest. God has given us the word, but we're not applying it. We don't know how to apply the word. So we are powerless. Because I notice that every time we go to pray for somebody and we think God, when the case is really tough and we think God's going to give us some miraculous thing, God sent us right back to the word. And I'm like, wow, that's how the word is powerful? He sent us right back to the word. So no matter where we go and go in a circle, it comes back to the word. I share the testimony again when we had a young lady traveled from the U.S., and she came here to be delivered. And when we were praying for her for hours, we could not get a breakthrough. And we tried everything and we couldn't get a breakthrough. And I went outside to pray. And the Lord says, go and use, I think it was Psalms 143. I don't quite remember. I think it is. And the Lord says, I cannot get into her heart. How can I heal her? And her heart is shut down. So I took the Psalms 143 and I went back to the office. His dad was there and her dad was there. And I gave her the Psalms and says, I want you to read Psalms 143. And when she started to re read it, and when she got to a, the verse that talks about the heart, she dropped it down and started to say, that's me, that's me. And she started to vent that she have a friend that did her wrong and she hate her friend and she's not going to forgive her friend. And her dad was in shock. The word was what pierced her heart. She was shut up and she would not confess. How can we pray for deliverance if we are carrying burden of unforgiveness? We have enough people in our hearts, but we come to be delivered. God don't work like that. No wonder God sends some of us away to study the word first. If we don't believe and understand how the Holy Spirit works, you think we are going to be filled with the power? No. We have to understand how it works so we know how to apply it. God is not going to give you a, a, a equipment in your hand and you don't know and you're confused and say, what do I do now? He's going to teach us first how to use it. He's going to teach us how to use the weapon, the word first. And when he teaches us how to use the weapon, he's going to send us into the war. He's not just going to cast us in. There's some people, miraculously things may happen. But overall, God is saying we need to know the word. And if you really think about it deeply right now, how many of us really study the word? I know it's easy to say, I read a chapter. This. How many studied like what I said about Isaiah chapter 6? Where you did one verse, and if you don't understand it, you go and do some research. And if you see a word you don't understand, you go and try to find out what is it, or who was talking, what type of time that was. We don't have those times. You get up, you just read the Psalms, and you're gone. <laughs> no, serious. <laughs> So how can we fight then? How can we want God to fight for us? When the men back then, you heard about Enoch walk with God. Walking, he was studying the word. He was a living example of the word. Walking and preaching and talking the word of God. God was residing within him. To do that, we need a lot of time. Sister Monica, we need time. I'm telling you, we, we need a time, Melvin. You, you see what I'm saying? We need the time. If you wake up 6 o'clock, people are tired, and you roll out of bed 6 o'clock, and you're thinking, man, I got to go. You're reading the word, and you're watching the time. I got to get out of here. 
How many of us so focused? Submission. How many of us? Focus where you stay in the word and try to study even three verses for two, three hours and do the research on it and ask God, how do I apply this? That's why the Psalms are so powerful because David is practical. David, when David talked to God and said, Lord, help me. David is real. That's why he said he's a man after God's own heart. He opened up to God and said, God, I transgress. My sin is ever before me. I need your help. Iniquity is in me, Lord. Purge me with Cersei. Wash me, O oh God. Give me some ex locks in the spiritual realm. I want to be clean. He's getting down dirty and say, God, flush me. He was getting real. But how many of us? How many of us will spend a couple hours reading Psalms 51 for cleansing? Or we are like, we know it already. You just read through it and you're gone. Five minutes. And we say that we study. You know? We said, we studied, man. You know? And we read the things for five minutes. How many of us do that? How many of us God is calling to a higher calling to study the word and apply the word? God is truly calling us to study the word and apply the word. If we want to experience the power of God, there's too many people that is suffering, guys. We receive so many calls until we are tired and overworked with people who want to be set free. What do we do? We have to learn the word first. If we don't learn the word, if you notice, when Jesus was passing that man who needed to be delivered, who was blind, and the man says, Jesus, O thou son of David, have mercy. It meant that he, he know about him. He was inquiring. He knows something. If we come to receive healing, we have to know about Jesus and his power. We have to know what he did on the cross, that he really died for our sin and is able to deliver us. I'm telling you, the God that we serve, he wants to save us. He don't want us to go through the pain and the suffering. Some people going through so much. I'm telling you, God is able. God is able. But we have to allow him. We got to know about him and invite his presence in. And then we can see the results. I am determined that I cannot continue to be a regular Christian with people suffering around me. I got to dig in the words some more. I'm telling you, we got to dig in the word. God is able. God is able. God is able. What a God we serve. I'm just happy to see that family as they come in. You know, all of us here, we need Christ. We need a deliverance. We need support. We need help. I'm telling you, I'm speaking from my heart. Because God showed us that if we apply his word, we're going to see healing. But in order to apply the word, we have to study the word. If we start to open the Bible and study the word, we're going to experience the power. Because too long we're going to church and not seeing healing. What's the purpose of God's church? Just to go in and look pretty? What's the purpose? God is saying to his children, if you study the word and make this word your defense. I was reading Job 25. 22, verse 25. I'm going to go down to verse, to verse 26 now. And hear what it says. It says, For then shall 
thou have thy delight in the Almighty and shall lift up thy face unto God. He's saying that when God is our defense, we're going to be happy. We're going to be delighted. God is fighting the battle for us. We don't have to do it. He will do it, but we have to understand the power of his blood defending us. And hear what verse 27 says. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Come on, I don't know if you get that. God is saying if we invite him and understand his power, and when he bless us and defend us, and we pray to him, we're going to have answers. And when we have answers, we have to give thanks. We have to pay our vows, pay our respect, give him respect, give him what he deserves, praise him. Look at it that way, all he deserves. He's not telling you to come and give him money for what he has done. He's saying, make a sacrifice to me. Honor me. Respect me. I did that for you. Exalt his name. Give him praise and thanks. He's saying, when I am your defense, I'm going to stand up for you. Look at verse 28. I think verse 28 is really powerful. And that's what the Lord gave me. Verse 28 of Job 22 says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. I don't know if you get it. He's saying again the spirit of authority, speaking the things through the blood of Jesus Christ and the name, and it shall be done in Jesus' name. And you shall see and know. You shall understand. When you speak the thing with authority, it's going to happen. Because Christ is our defense. We are operating under the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established. The words. God is saying there's power in the word, in the promises. When you pray and you use the promises like, God, you, David said he was young and now he's old. And he have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I'm asking you to supply my need. I declare it in the name of Jesus Christ that I'm going to receive money tomorrow. But we don't have that faith, you see, to declare that. We don't have that faith to declare you see, we are not applying the word. Can we use this verse 8 without faith? Listen, listen. <laughs> Brethren, I, you have to get this. Because we can't be the same when we, we left from this meeting tonight. We cannot be the same. God is saying there's power in the tongue. There's power in his promises. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood. And if we adjust and put everything into the right, right per perspective and knows how to apply it, we're going to get answers to prayer. And we're going to see deliverance. But it's like working out a math problem. Some people are going to say, well, why God make it so hard? You know what? If you need a house, you're going to research it. You're going to go on the internet. You're going to do everything when you want that house. But when you want to apply and want deliverance, you ain't spending the time in the Word. You just want to give God two seconds and you're gone. But we expect God to work anyhow. No. We can't give God the leftover. If we put out the effort and wrestle with God and say, I need a breakthrough. Show me what I need to do, Lord. The Spirit of God is going to give us that breakthrough. Brethren, I'm speaking with authority. I'm speaking with great conviction because I know that the name is powerful. I've seen it happen. I've experienced it with so many testimonies. You know, some people, you may pray for them and you don't get the breakthrough. 
there's several reasons why the breakthrough don't come. Probably God keeps something because he's trying to reach your grandparents or the parents or, or a sister. So he kept that situation to get you. He's actually calling you. So later on, when you understand, you're like, that's why you didn't deliver this person. Because you were trying to get my attention. If God's people go to him and ask him, what's my purpose? Why didn't you deliver me? Why you kept me in the darkness? You seen the suffering I'm going through. Why don't you help me, Lord? He will answer. But we don't put out the effort to ask God. We just ask God and we do more cursing. You don't love me. Look what you did. Why should I go to church? Why should I serve you? We curse God instead. How can he work? Because we don't really believe. I'm telling you, if we're not experiencing the power of God working, we need to start close all the churches. It's just money-making thing. It have no purpose. If we are not seeing and experience peace and seeing God work, close the churches. I know I've seen the power of God work many times in this ministry. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be in it. I would be closed it up and done a long time. But I've experienced the power. We have seen people call on the prayer line and being delivered on the prayer line several times. We have witnesses. So what I'm saying then, if we seen the power of God working like that, and we are not tapped in fully, what if we are tapped in fully? We're going to see miracles. You know, I share before that we need to watch David Gates. You can Google David Gates and watch his testimonies. Lord of mercy, you wonder if this is an ordinary man. Angel come and talk to him and deliver him in some place where they kidnap him. All different things happen. I remember he was driving some computer to deliver to a school because he gave gifts and he helped out. He's a missionary. And he was driving and the vehicle broke down right in front of a, a little convenience store. But when he looked around, he knew that this is the ghetto of Mexico. And when he got out, he went into the convenience store man and he says, get out of here. Like, you're in ghetto, get out. So he said, by the time he go back to his vehicle, he tried to start it, it won't start. And he can't start it. And when he looked, he saw some guys coming with baseball bat, like a group of guys coming towards him. And he's praying and begging God, help me. And while he's pleading to God, he saw a man came up to talk to him and said, you better get out of here. And then he, the man says, I will push you to start the car. And he's like, all of a sudden the man go and start to push the car going, it was an angel. The car, the men then when they came close, they froze. They could not cross the barrier. You can go and research it. There's so many testimonies that David Gates gave. He's a missionary. He owns probably over 30 planes. He bought the Bolivia um, TV station without money. You go look it up. Put in an offer with zero money for like 2.5 million US. You can go research it. What kind of faith is that? Where is God's people standing? What are we doing now? as God's people who are called in the last days. The Lord showed me that we are not studying the word and applying it. So we are not seeing the healing power because we just glance, glance over the word. We don't understand it, but we expect God to work. He said here in verse 28 of Job, thou shalt also decree a thing, meaning call it out. Say it in faith, and it shall be done. It shall be established. Why is the Bible saying that if that's not true? Come on. I'm looking at the last verse while I'm preaching. The Lord told me to go to Hebrews, the faith scripture. Because without faith, we can't accomplish anything. So if you could pray all you want, if you don't have the faith, we ain't going to see anything work. And we know what faith is. You can look from verse 1, but I want you to go to 
verse 6. I'm going to read 6 to 10 to close. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What does that say? He's saying that it's impossible. Our duty is to please God in our worship so we can be blessed. We can go home with him. And he's saying that it's impossible to please me unless we come with everything and seek him. Are we giving him everything? Are we really seeking him? When you have a situation that is before you, are you laying down and praying without ceasing? Stop from eating for two, three days and go to God and say, I'm fed up. Please help me, O oh God. I need a breakthrough. I need to be delivered. I see my child in this condition. Help me, Lord. You think the Lord won't help? It's because we just ask for two minutes and we continue to do what we're doing. And when we're tired and fed up again, we ask. God is saying, no, come to me. I love you. I want to set you free. I bid you to come. It's impossible to please me without stepping out in faith. And in verse 7 it says, By faith Noah, being one of God of things not seen as yet, move with fear and prepare an ark to the saving of his house, by the wish he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous wishes by faith. This is so deep. Noah take up a charge to do something that he have never experienced before. He's trusting in God, stepping out in his grace. And verse 8 it says, By faith Abraham, which he was called, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out, not knowing where he went. Don't know where he was going. God gave him the charge and the promise and he went. Verse 9 says, By faith he sojourned into a land of promise, as in, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. It's just the word he was going by. God promised this, I'm going to do it. I don't care if it takes me to my grave, I'm doing it. The Lord said it. What great faith. And hear what verse 10 says I will read. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. So deep, brethren. So deep. God is saying it's impossible to please him and to prioritize and to plan without we have faith. So right now, if you want to be delivered, you got to go home. If you're watching tonight, you're watching live, you're listening on the prayer line, you're calling in from different countries, and you're fed up, you're going through this thing, and you want to be delivered. Get a paper, and when you get the paper, you're going to write out the strategy of how am I going to be delivered. First, I got to find a promise. The word is true. And when you find a promise, you got to know how to apply it. You see, if we come for deliverance, first we got to cleanse ourselves. When I say cleanse yourself, go to the mercy seat and ask God for forgiveness. Repent and say, Lord, wash me with your blood and prepare me for this breakthrough. Just do it. Just go to God. And when you start to apply the word, the promises, if you're going through financial struggle, he said, a thousand cattle upon a thousand hills are mine. All the silver and gold are mine. Then you can go to God and say, God, if you own everything and you said, I'm your child, 
You said you won't withhold anything from them that loves you. You said if the earthly father knows how to give good gifts, what about your heavenly father? I am yours, O God, I'm suffering. David said in the Psalms, I was young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. When you lay that out to God and go like Hezekiah to the altar and say, here I am, your child. God will answer you. God will supply your needs, brethren. God will make a breakthrough. If you want healing, you talk to God and say, God, if you transform Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul used to kill Christians. Lord, I grew up in the church. I love you. I've never killed anybody. But here I am, Lord. I want an encounter. I want a breakthrough with you. You delivered Paul. I see Paul and Silas. Paul, they went into the, the jail with Peter. And they were trained up. And they had worship and all the chains fell off. God, you have the power. If Peter was walking, Peter who denied you three times, not once, not twice, but three times. And if Peter denied you, and Peter passed the man and said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. If Peter has such power who denied you, you are the restorer. You can put me in line, oh God. You can restore me. You can remake me. If you, do, you need to do what you need to do. In Jeremiah chapter 1, it talks about rooting up, pulling down, replant. God, whatever you need to re, re root, take it out my life. Pull out what you need to pull out. Rip it down and replenish. Plant over, Lord. I need a breakthrough. I need to be delivered. I'm fed up. I need a deliverance. I'm tired. I need a breakthrough. If you go to the mercy seat like that, what kind of God that we serve that wouldn't hear this crying? He said the mother loved the suckling baby, but I love you more. Lord of mercy, pure love the Lord is pouring out. Why wouldn't he heal you? Why wouldn't he help you? Probably you're going through a test, Sister Jessica. Probably you're going through something. Probably God loves you and he wants to build you. He probably wants you to join the team to pray for others. So he have you in the valley until he replenish the power because he wants you to search the word some more. You see, when the end is over, you know, my favorite, Job 23, from verse 10. When Job says, I argue with God. I go everywhere. I look and say if I could find him to tell me what I'm going to. Why? And Job said, when I go everywhere, I can't find him. It meant that Job was praying and not getting a breakthrough because that was a test. If you are in the valley for the struggling, perhaps it's a test. God is keeping you. But if you pre pre prepare and pray without ceasing, God is going to show you. Job did not sin. Job was in the valley and praying and praying. And when he seek God until he couldn't, then he said, he knows the way I take. And when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. When he's finished with me, I'm going to be better. When he takes me out of the valley, when he takes me out of the poverty, I'm going to be better. That's what he's saying. When he takes me up, I'm going to be better. If you claim that promise and say, Lord, I'm going to be better when you take me up. I'm telling you, God is going to do it. God will do it, brethren. We need to step out in faith. We need to hear from God. I'm telling you, brethren, I am, I am tired to see God's people suffer. And people are asking, where is God? Just be encouraged. You're listening tonight. Just be encouraged. You're tired of being in the valley. God is saying, I love you still. 
Look at Job, what happened. At least you have a roof over your head still. At least your body is not inflicted with sickness. At least your skin is still intact. You may not have food on your table, but it could have been worse. I see your problem. I know what you're going through. But I'm here to let you know that I love you and deliverance is coming. All I'm asking you to do is pray the word with precision. Know how to apply the word of God. And if we go away from here tonight, get in the promises together and plan how to apply them. We don't apply and ask God for something without confessing. He ain't going to get it. Some of us have the promises mixed up. And we can't, we're not prioritizing and see what comes first. We're not organizing with precision. Because God gives us the wisdom and the knowledge how to pray to see things happen. God is saying if we organize ourselves, we're going to experience his power. Tonight as we close, I'm going to ask God to help us and teach us how to apply the word. Because the devil don't want us to study the word. That's why as soon as some people open the word, they're falling asleep. They can't stay up. But if they have to watch the television, they'll be up all night and don't sleep. But as soon as you grab the word, you read a couple of verses, you're bucking. You got to stand up and rebuke the devil. You got to be like me then. I will stand up with the word. If I'm falling asleep, I'll stand up with a flashlight and going around and reading and walking and say, yes, Lord, there's power in the blood. No, serious. <laughs> we we got to apply. We can't just stay in the bed. Like some people call the prayer line and they're in their bed listening to the prayer line. Come on. The devil don't have to do much to put it to sleep. I'm telling you, he don't have to do much. You can't be listening to the prayer line and covering up under your sheet. Come on. You're going to fall asleep. It's easy. We need to stand up, go in the kitchen, go somewhere and pierce up and down and say, Lord, I praise you. Give him some praise. We got to apply the principles. We got to apply the wisdom. If you're going to do a mathematical problem, you got to follow the, 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 the symbols or the, the, the formulas if you're going to apply certain things. If they give you to work out the sign, sign uh, angles of something, you can't apply um, something else, X square. No. You got to apply the right principles. If you're going to do something, you have to apply it if you go against it. If man is so serious, what about God? I work on aircraft. Every day I'm in a plane. And this thing is serious. Because what is a little mistake if a little scratch, you can't let that go. That snag, they're going to snag it and they're going to ride it up. It's serious. Because when the plane reach way up there at 40,000 feet, this thing is going to turn into a crack. And that can crash the plane. It has to be blended out and the right principles have to be applied in order for it to be okay. If man is so serious, if you try to hide that and they find it, you're fired on the spot. You're messing with lives. Every job you do, you have to stamp it. So if something go wrong, 20 years planes I work on, they will come back and arrest me at my home if something goes wrong and it's my fault. If man is so strict, why we give God anything? If we apply the principles like those prophets, they spend time and lay out everything and take the promises and apply them. They have to be deliverance. But we have no time. No time. We give God the leftover. As soon as we're going to sleep, when it's five minutes of sleep, we roll over the Bible and say a little prayer and we're gone. And then we complain and say, where is God? No breakthrough. Where is God? It's true. It's a real thing. If we start to apply it like how we go to work, even when we go to church, we go late, we do anything. But on the job, you're there because it's more important to you. So how God is going to treat us? Are we going to get the breakthrough? 
he said, if you stand up for me, I will stand up for you. We need to stand up for Jesus. I'm going to pray right now. I'm praying for changes, for God's people to use knowledge to apply the word. And if we research it tonight, how to see somebody be delivered or healed, trust me. I remember a church we go to, I have to say this, and we're praying for a lady, and we weren't fasting, and the lady was demon-possessed. And the demon spoke and said, we only come out through prayer and fasting, and you guys are not fasting. The demon spoke through the lady and said that. And we weren't fasting. But we, did, we just said, you know what, we're not fasting, but we're calling on the blood of Jesus going to get you out. It was the same spirit while I was there. The spirit came to me and says, where do you get these two weaklings to come and fight me? They are daring. But I'm just trying to tell you how the, the warfare work that God's people have to organize. If we're going into warfare and we're not fasting, the devil knows. And he knows that there's power in fasting. But some of us don't even know that. And we're Christian 30 years. And we never fast yet. I'm telling you, how can we get deliverance? We, we're fooling ourselves. If we come together and fast and claim and put the right promises in perspective, walls are going to be broken down. Deliverance is going to come. God is going to do that. I'm going to pray. Close your eyes where you are. Right now, you're listening on the prayer line. You're watching live. I'm going to pray that God will do something tonight to make a breakthrough for you. That he will transform your heart and give you that knowledge and understanding to apply the word of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, great God, you are God, the Jehovah Nisse, the God who sit high and look low. Earth is your footstool. There's none like you, O oh God. You said you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's nothing between. You are God. You won the victory already on the cross. You paid the penalty for all of us. Our names are already written in the Lamb's book of life. The only way we are lost, unless we erase our names. We are already saved by grace. And if we are saved, we are hearers with Christ. We died with you, we rose again. And we are seated beside Christ in high places now. Therefore, we have privileges. We can call for angels and they will have to come. Because we have that authority through the blood of Jesus. So Lord, help us to know our rightful heritage. That we are not ordinary. We are conquerors through Jesus. So help us, O oh God, to walk as if we are conquerors. We are not losers. We are not down in the valley. We are not depressed. We are lifted up. We are crowned with glory. We are made just a little bit lower than the angels. We have authority. We have royalty in our blood. We are special. Oh God, you are our Father. Hallelujah. Bless us now, oh God, and may you transform the hearts of your people. May you place knowledge upon everyone that is listening to my voice. May you send wisdom and understanding so that we will know how to apply the word. I thank you, oh God, because I know it's done. I'm speaking in authority. That is done. Your people have received it. And they're going to go forth to use it. Because if we don't use it, we'll lose it. So Lord, I thank you and I praise you. Because you have heard and you have delivered. I give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody on the prayer line, Sister Walters is going to be taking the prayer request on the prayer line. And then for here and those who are watching live, I just want to say thanks for watching again. The Button to Christ ministry, continue to pray for us and support us 
as we grow and we are going to just go in the mission field to witness for Christ. God be with you and strengthen you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.